It's great uh, to know that every week we gather together and we worship. We always center ourselves around the scripture and the very word of God as um, that's what we have in common. We're united through these words. So I invite you to be with me as we share in this time of reflection. Uh, you know, when I first became a, a pastor at the United Church of Christ, it was my, uh, in Moline, Illinois, I had been there for some time and people started to tell me about the previous pastors who had had the privilege of serving in that church. Almost all of them had been there for quite some time and had long tenures. But there was one person who served many decades before me who didn't last very long in the church. And people let me know how that came about. They had a few stories that they would tell me. One of the stories they told me was the time when that pastor was new at the church he was in the sanctuary and a conservative, a very conservative member of the board of trustees of that church was showing him around the beautiful, stunningly beautiful sanctuary that's in Moline. He was showing him the chancel area that the granddaughter of John Deere had financed the redoing. It was filled with amazing carvings all over and statuettes. Even in the pulpit, there were different statues for important people in the faith. And he looked at that new pastor with glee, a glimmer in his eye, and he said, Pastor, you know, there is a Republican in the pulpit. Uh, and he walked over to that beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, pulpit and pointed out the statue of Abraham Lincoln. Well, the new pastor didn't want to miss a beat when he probably should have missed a beat. He said, that's okay. Jesus was a Democrat. Not the smartest thing to have done to start out in that church, apparently. But it was the way he started. And I wonder sometimes when we read uh, this parable that is probably familiar to many of you that we've, that we've shared this morning. I wonder about this parable it would seem to suggest that maybe Jesus' political way of thinking is not exactly as some of us have come to think of. Maybe Jesus had a different way of seeing things. He seems to come off as uh, someone who brings out the worst elements of capitalism in this story that he tells us this morning. This morning he tells a story. It's a story about a man, uh, about three different servants, uh, who he gives money to. And one of the servants is a poor man who obviously didn't do very well because he buried the money. And therefore, he is thrown into the outer darkness. So it's a story about the poor man having what's taken from him and given to wealthier people, which sounds like a lot of things that we understand capitalism can sometimes be. But I want to retell the story to you today for those of you who may be unfamiliar with it. Jesus tells it about a wealthy man who goes on a journey, decides to leave his three servants portions of the money that they can invest while he's gone and hopefully make him money. To one, he gives an enormous amount of money and says, now go and invest it. To the other, he gives a lot of money, but not quite the same. And to the last servant, who he had the least confidence in, he gave a small amount of money told him that when he would come back that he would given they would each given him accounting of what they had done with that money. Well after he comes back he goes and the man who, who gave the most money to brings him back double, a hundred percent profit on the money he had been entrusted with. Oh he's so pleased with the man and he rewards the man. He says uh, to the next man who comes, how did you do? And the man shows him the money that he had been given and how there's Double now what that money was given. Finally, the last man, the third man comes. He was a man who was given very little. And he comes up to the master, to the wealthy man and says, Sir, I know you to be a hard and cruel man. You expect to make a profit where you did not sow and invest. So, being afraid, I did the best thing, the most prudent thing. I went and hid that money. And here, here's every penny of it that I give back to you. Well, the wealthy man was not pleased at all with this. 
fact, he was very angry about it. He told him how worthless he was for having done this, that he could have invested the money with the bankers at least and made something on the money. And he throws him into the utter darkness where there will be gnashing of teeth. Now, this is a story that um, I've always preached many times before. I like to preach it in the time of stewardship, as most pastors I know do. And I was tempted this time just to go ahead and preach it like I've always done and not do much study. Now, I'm glad I didn't do that. I am glad I decided that I would do a little bit of study on this because what I discovered was that there is at least one other way to see this story that I'd never heard before. Now, the way I usually preach it, it's a message of stewardship, just like most pastors see this story. The problem is, is that that man who had that small talent, he didn't have much talent at all, underestimated how important it was what he had. That he should have invested his talent. He should have invested the money that he had. He should have done something with it, regardless of how insecure and insignificant he thought it would have been. And therefore, he failed to be courageous, and he faced the negative fate that he faced. The story works beautifully, really, for an upper middle class congregations, because we're so used to hearing and talking about investing and getting ahead, and that's the name of life. And we pastors want to make sure you folks invest some of what you have in your church, and some of your talents, and some of your wealth as well. But as I said this past week, I saw an entirely different story, an entirely different way of interpreting this parable. Back in the 1980s, the Catholic Foreign Missionary Society of America published a four-volume commentary. It wasn't your traditional set of commentaries on the Bible, the teachings of Jesus. This set of commentaries came by listening to the poor people of Central America and what they had to say when they read the gospel or heard it read to them. And what they heard was something very, very different. There was a priest on one Sunday that uh, this part was included in the commentary that decided he would not preach to the congregation. Rather, he would share the scripture of this parable and simply have a conversation with them about how they heard this parable as people in rural uh, Central America. It was a time in Central America back in the late 1970s and early 80s where there was vast poverty, vast gaps between the rich and poor. In fact, in Nicaragua, where this was taking place, the very president at the time was a man that owned... Um, about 30% of the land and had about 40% of the wealth in that nation. One family had that. And so he shared the parable of the talents with them. And here is some of the conversation of what people said, how they heard this parable. One person shared his opinion first. He said, oh, it's a lousy parable. He went on to talk about how it was that poor people now needed to, get to condemn Thoughts like this. What happened to that poor man in the parable happens to us all of the time, he said. He talked about how hard the bankers are on us who are poor. And when we get desperate, they, they loan us money at high interest rates. And when we can't pay it back, oh, they're unmerciful with us. And we find ourselves starving and not being able to feed our families. The next person, his wife spoke. She said... Well, it seems to me, when Jesus told this story, there must have been masters and slaves, and that's the way the world was divided. So I think Jesus was telling this parable to talk to people the way where they would understand. When he shared this parable, they would see themselves in it, because like that last man, he's very much like we are. Then the priest said, Jesus was seeing the exploitation that there was in the society at his time, and what he saw then, it's the very same thing that goes on now, but even worse with the bankers and the finances as they are today. In other words, the poor person, the poor people in Latin America didn't see this parable about the danger of bearing your talents and not taking risk with what you had. No, for them, from their viewpoint, it was a parable that reflected the very same plight of poor people that lived in Jesus' time. 
The poor man buried his gold rather than invest the money because as he said to the rich man, the rich man is a cruel man. A cruel man who expects to reap where he is not even invested and therefore is an act of prudence rather than risk losing it and bearing the brunt of the rich man's con condemnation. He buried it and returned it all 100% and then was tossed out into the out of darkness, into a life of hell, which is the way many poor people in Central America experience life. Now, when you hear this, you may think, well, that's really stretching the parable. That's not exactly what's said in the parable. And I can tell you there are plenty of very excellent scholars who will say, well, that's not a very uh, good way to read this parable. If you really read it, the text literally, that's not what you're going to find. And uh, it's tempting just to say, I don't want to listen to that. But you know something? As I started studying uh, the parable more, I realized something that was true. The people Jesus was speaking to were more like those people in Central America than us upper middle class people. When Jesus was speaking, a lot of the same things that was going on in the people of Central America was going on with his people. In Jesus' time, there were many wealthy people who had enormous amounts of wealth. They owned big tracts of land. They traded goods and crops all over the world. But they had all this money, and what were they to do to invest it? Well, in Jesus' time, one of the best ways and investments they could make was to lend just a little bit of that money to a very poor person who had a very small piece of land, and do it at high interest rates. It was, after all, a very risky investment. But either way, he won. Because if the man, the people they loaned money to, the poor people could pay it back, well, he made an enormous amount of, of money. But if they couldn't pay it back, he could take that poor man's small patch of dirt and add it to his own. Not only that, because that man no longer had a place to live and survive, he could employ that man as a day laborer and pay him a little of nothing and make him poorer than the man has ever been before. Well, that's exactly what was happening in Central America in their experience. And that's the way it's often happened, even in our own country. I think back in the Mississippi Delta when slavery was done away with, to keep people employed and to keep people there to do the land, they had something called sharecropping, which started out with a good purpose, but it ended up being used as a way of oppressing and keeping black people, freed slaves, powerless. Same thing in the cities. When we talk about what happened in the 1940s and 50s with redlining and rent to own houses, rent to buy houses, that if they couldn't pay it because of something, they'd lose every bit of equity they had in the house. I suspect we all now are hearing me say this and thinking, well, this is kind of a heavy exegetical sermon you're talking about here, Pastor. Maybe you ought to apply this in some way that we can do something with this sermon and get something out of it this week. And maybe you're thinking the interpretation of the parable by those poor folks, well, it's, it's a lot of hogwash, maybe. And you may be wondering where I'm heading with this. Well, as I can tell you, as I was writing, I was sometimes wondering where I was headed with this. But then it hit me. It hit me that I most want to say to you to this day has nothing to do about which one of these interpretations is the proper interpretation of the parable. That maybe the message we need to hear is to hear that we all hear things very differently. That we hear something how we hear something depends on the situation which we ourselves find ourselves living with. When it comes to hearing the word of God, we are always predisposed to hear it in one way or another. I know there are Sundays when I, when I preach a message that, I, that many of you must go away and you think, you know, I really didn't get anything out of that today. It didn't say much to me. But there'll be somebody else in the congregation they may let me know and they'll say, you know, whatever it was you said, somehow God really spoke to me through that. There are times I think I've got a great sermon to preach. I feel very confident and I'm going to preach it and share it with you. But it seems to fall flat when I preach it. 
And then there are times where I think I've not really prepared. It's not exactly, I'm not ready to, uh, to, to preach it. And I'll get through it and be kind of embarrassed. And next thing I know, someone says, you know, through that sermon of yours, as inadequate as it can be, God spoke a word to me that I desperately needed to hear this week. Which is all to say, it's not just about the preacher, not even the story. It's about how we come to it. Are we coming to the text? Are we coming into worship? Are we coming into our time with fertile fields, ready to hear and expectantly to hear a word from God? And however we come into this, to it may affect how well we hear something. That's especially true from this cultural, social, economic background we come to. We people in the middle class easily can hear this parable. It's a parable that talks about investing and making money and getting ahead and what the consequences if you don't do the right thing. We can certainly relate to that from upper middle class vantage points. But a poor person in Nicaragua who's very desperate hears these words of Jesus and they hear Jesus saying something very different to them. Same way when African slaves back during the, in the Old Testament when their masters would preach to them the story of, of the exodus, the story of the oppression of, of the Pharaoh over the people of Israel. They didn't hear it as a message about sin and forgiveness. No, they heard it as a message about freedom and liberation because that was the world and the word that God had for them. It's true when it comes in hearing the word of God. How we are predisposed affects how we hear it. And the truth is never, never that there is one absolutely correct way of hearing things. In fact, we believe in the United Church of Christ that if I take a Bible, that Bible is very holy to us. It's holy to us because it is a book that has been preached for generations and has had the power to transform lives. But let me say this, it's just a book. It's just pages. It's a human creation. It's imperfect. It's got inadequacies. It's, it's contradictory sometimes. It's inerrant. It's, er it's errant. It's got mistakes in it. And yet, we're the same way. And God uses us in our inadequacies to proclaim God's word. In the same way, God uses the Bible for what it is. And it is a transforming, transformative power in our lives. And the key thing is that we come to it prepared to hear. Now all of this is to come and say to you, sometimes we can be rather arrogant in our perspectives. Sometimes we think we're absolutely right and the way we see things is the way things really are. But there may be more than one perspective. In fact, there may be many perspectives. How many couples find themselves in protracted arguments insisting that they have their right perspective and their mate doesn't have the right perspective? How many parents sometimes think, I know how this is supposed to be, this is the way it's going to be, and we don't do a very good job of listening to our children? We certainly don't understand each other in our country very well. And sure enough, we may never agree with some opinions that we hear. But how well do we do with listening and trying to understand at least where someone's coming from, how they've come to see things as they are. We're only beginning as a nation to wake up and to begin to listen to our black brothers and sisters and understand the perspective that they bring to things, how their life experience is very different than the way ours is, and we have a lot we could learn from them. The best we can do is to learn to get out of those old, beat-up, comfortable shoes that we're so used to wearing and take them off long enough to wear the shoes, to walk in the shoes of another person or another group of people or a people with a very different life experience than our own. Because it is from there that we can learn to hear one another. In this this week is the word God has for us. Be open. Be open with humility to what others have to say to you, that you may hear God speaking, however it shall come to you. Amen.